James Strass O'Leary is a driven individual who is rapidly nearing the quality of Riot's very own LCS commentators. Strass began his esports career as a writer, but after tasting live commentary for the first time at an iSeries event, he decided to transition fully. Dignitas has helped to cultivate his abilities to see him reach new heights, and before long it wouldn't be surprising if Riot themselves extended an offer. <laughs> Thanks for sitting down to talk with us. You just completed day one of the second Face It Challenger Invitational. How's it going? Yeah, it's, it's going really well. Really enjoyable day one. Uh, we had a couple of upsets, a couple of teams that were expected to win one and uh, a couple of teams that were expected to turn up, not turn up. But, you know, it, it's kind of how things go sometimes. Tournaments are always uh, a bit different, ever-changing. How are you liking the studio environment? It's really cool. I, I, I really love the Faces studio. Uh, it's the second time here, as uh, I was here earlier in the year. Just really love everything about the studio. It, it's so cool being in an environment where everything's uh, really professionally done. Uh, all of everything just works and it's, it's so fun. Especially things like having replays and stuff like that in-game really, really changes up uh, the feel of the production. So how did you get into commentary? Uh, it's kind of a weird thing. I did some radio and stuff like that in university and uh, it actually was at an event I-46 in the UK, uh, run uh, yeah, out of Telford in the UK. So I, I was there, they needed a League of Legends caster and I'd kind of done a li little bit of StarCraft and it was actually Dignitas Odi said, they need a caster, you've done interviews for us, so go and go on stage and cast. So my first game I ever casted was in front of like 400 people, uh, iSeries. So from there, I just kind of loved everything about casting and pretty much just made it my job. So what figures in and around esports have you looked up to or aspired to emulate? Uh, so one of the people that I kind of looked up to very early on was Day9 in my casting career. I was very heavily into StarCraft. Um, and I really looked up to like the, the kind of uh, professionalism he had on uh, the, everything that he did. So that was one of the people. And then as I transitioned into League, um, when I was doing play-by-play, -play, I was looking a lot at what Demon and Joe Miller were doing. Uh, now that I'm doing color, I'm looking a, a lot at what Jat is doing uh, and a lot of the color commentators that they got. Uh, it's kind of one of those things that I, I'll look at what casters are doing, but I'm not in a state where I, I want to become another caster. I want to become myself and be as good. But, you know, I'll, I'll go and look at things that I like that casters are doing and, and maybe kind of borrow uh, a couple of their attributes from time to time. So how uh, did your status as a Dignitas member come to pass and how influential have they been to your development as a commentator or a professional in esports? So I applied for a writing position at Dignitas for the website. Uh, I'd actually interviewed Odie as a freelance writer a couple of months previously, and he actually remembered me and said, OK, yeah, let's, let's get this guy on board. It, it took me about six months to actually, uh, you know, get my work together and actually start doing things because I was in university at the time. Um, but from there, ever since, Odie has been like uh, an integral part of actually my growth as a commentator. He gave me a couple of opportunities that uh, I don't think would have been possible without him. Luckily, I feel like I've done them justice, uh, but it's, it's kind of been like a mutual uh, help. I mean, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say they're the only reason where I am, whereas where I am, that kind of sounds a bit immodest, but they've definitely helped me uh, a significant amount through the very early goings because of the contacts that uh, were available for helping and, you know, growing. And they, they know esports pretty well. So, yeah, they've, they've helped a lot. So what's your approach to improving yourself as a commentator? So I watch pretty much every one of my casts back uh, in some capacity, whether it's looking at bits or whether it's looking at the entire thing and breaking it down. Um, I also feel like currently I work with uh, a handful of casters that we continually work on synergy, work on growth. Like, the best thing about it is um, we're actually all friends. So myself, Pulse, uh, Metas, uh, even Panky, who currently is working for Riot, we all talk pretty much every day. And I feel like that actually has quite a, a big impact on our casting because we can grow the professional kind of aspect of it by looking at replay analysis, but you cannot you can't fake synergy with the caster. You, that just looks so fake when you don't actually know each other as well as uh, a good casting duo will. So I think that's one of the strengths I've had is that the people I cast with, I'm actually just really good friends with. Have you had any casting revelations that helped you improve? For example, taking it slower, maybe focus on voice control? 
Uh, I have had a couple. I think, and this was one I kind of had re really early on, um, of that transition from kind of fan to caster, when you realize that there's more beyond just the two roles of casting. Um, there's play-by-play -play and, and color analysis, and those aren't exactly mutually exclusive, and just because you can do one doesn't mean you can't do the other. I mean, I kind of attribute a lot of the hate that a, a caster like Rivington, who, get, uh, who gets a lot of criticism for quote-unquote not knowing the game. Rivington's been working on the game for nearly three years now. He knows the game pretty well. I, I mean, well enough that most people wouldn't be able to co comprehend the knowledge he has, but he plays the role so well of trying to uh, open up the segue for his, his co-commentator that one of the revelations to me was that that actually exists, is that you can play different roles and act different parts at different parts of the game and allow your co-commentator to shine through even better than they would do if they were doing it themselves. So what's the end game like for you? Do you see yourself doing commentary in 10 years? There's... My goals overall are a little bit different. I, I mean, I kind of would like to be doing commentary in 10 years. In fact, I, I would like to be doing commentary in 10 years, regardless of, of where we are with regards to esports. I still think we've got a long road ahead of us and I, I want to be on it for the duration, but there's a lot of sports that I watch that I feel like I could, uh, if you know, it, if push came to shove, I could transition over to or would like to transition to given the opportunity. So I think in some capacity of kind of broadcast, whether it's uh, radio or some kind of sports broadcast, anything like that, I think would be uh, something that I'd be really, really looking forward to, maybe looking to progress into as I get later in my career. Is there a particular thing that you're looking to do, like really, really want to do that you could consider a crowning achievement? So I was at the 2013 World Finals uh, for League of Legends. When I was there, I said that I'd do 2014 just to myself as like a personal goal. I, that's still a long way away. So that would be a big goal to me. But if it's not 2014, 2015, I will cast. I, <laughs> I, I'm pretty adamant that that's like my personal goal but that would be a big crowning achievement to be would be to have that kind of recognition on that kind of stage which I know is is a fairly ambitious goal but I think you've got to kind of aim big it's uh, no use taking small goals at a time nice to go for a big one so what's your favorite team and why so outside of Dignitas I'm actually a big super hot crew fan right now who are a European LCS team mainly because uh, one of my very good friends is on the team uh, so I was working a lot with uh, Matt Impaler uh, who was on Dignitas UK for a while, and I'm a pretty good friend with him. So I, I'm always rooting for them when they play. Uh, it's not like a playstyle choice or anything, but just, you know, supporting friends. Is there a favorite hero for you, and what uh, could you explain why that playstyle is appealing? Hmm, that's a good question, because I actually play quite a few. Uh, it kind of depends on what my current champion pool is. I play a lot of Lee Sin. Um, I'm not the best at Lee Sin. I'm no insect. I'm not the best uh, amazing Korean jungler kind of thing. But I, I just like his playstyle in the jungle. There's a lot of freedom to actually kind of make plays, which is pretty cool for me. What are some of the most interesting storylines to you recently that you could talk about? Okay, so there's been a, a couple of different interesting uh, storylines in LCS and, and Challenger. I think one of my favorites has been kind of the rise of Cloud9, just in general. Uh, the fact that they've now taken two teams that have been very successful in the Challenger League. One is on top of North American LCS, the other is uh, has been doing pretty well in European Challenger. That's something to me that's pretty interesting, that they've found two pretty good strong teams, consistent teams, but to me as, as a caster and um, as a fan, I think the just the advent of more challenger stuff has been really positive and as a storyline just kind of allows everybody to grow that little bit more. So as a caster you watch a huge quantity of the game so you must spot a lot of trends. What's the most frequent mistake that you spot at the top level of the game? The biggest mistake that people make at the highest level, even in LCS, is chasing kills when they really don't need to. Most top teams, if not all top teams, should know that objectives win you the games. Kills are just the way of getting there. And you'll see a team get one or two kills, then the choice is either they chase somebody behind a turret or they take the turret and then, you know, have a good lead from it. And they'll chase the person. And it's kind of getting caught up in that moment where you're in the mentality of, okay, I've got two kills, I'm going to go get a third, but take the objective. That's the, like, one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of teams make. Whereas I watch teams over in OGN, they far less often do that. They'll instantly rotate around and take an objective like a tower or a dragon. 
Going back to that point of the large quantity of league that you watch, what is it about the game? You know, why are you so into it? Why is it something you just can, you can just keep coming back to it again and again? It's everything from the storylines between teams when you know teams pretty intricately to the fact that there are, there are so many champions right now that can actually be played that it kind of doesn't end up stale. There are always kind of certain lane matchups that come up again and again, but we're in a situation where something like uh, 60% of champions have been played in LCS, which is kind of crazy when you think that there's nearly 120 champions in the game and kind of always get refreshed. So that's one of the other big things is the game is constantly evolving, uh, whether it's the meta that the players choose or whether whether it's patch notes or new champions that come out. There's just always something going on in the game. If you didn't get into esports in a professional sense, what would you have pursued? I'd probably still be doing my engineering degree. Um, that's probably where I'd be at uh, if, if I wasn't a professional in or professional in uh, esports. But I much prefer this. This is far, far, far better. How did the decision come to pass then that you decided to drop the degree to commit to esports? Uh, I was actually in my third year and kind of completed the degree. I, I kind of was at a point where I could have gone back and uh, continued uh, at a different point, but I devoted quite a bit of time to esports at this point. So it, it was kind of unfortunate how, how it kind of ended up going. But saying that, I feel like I'm far happier for being where I am. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I, I tell everybody stay in school, but I'm not the best role model for, uh, for doing that myself. If there's an aspiring caster out there watching this interview right now, what steps should he take to become like you? The most important step is finish whatever education stage you're at. That's really important. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm not the best role model for that, but it is the best advice I think that anybody can give, uh, especially if you're in education that you paid for. You've paid for that education. Uh, it's one of the lessons that I've quickly learned after not being in education is that was kind of, you know, a waste of time and money. So complete it. Uh, it, it will benefit you because nobody knows how long this is going to be around for. Um, and it's better to have a secure future. But on top of that, uh, channel your passion. There's no point doing uh, 100 events in a week and then burning out and not being able to do them the next week. Set yourself goals uh, and also look to reach out to other casters for advice because we will give advice to other people like those a lot of people think that um the higher well i don't want to say higher because i, I feel that's pretty immodest of me but um the the casters that have got more experience aren't unapproachable i mean even to the point where jat and demon gave me advice a couple of months ago where I, when i was casting so it's very valuable and as somebody that's in this position where kind of people maybe feel like we're pretty experienced it's kind of good to see somebody come up to us and actually ask for advice because it gives us uh, reassurance that there are actually people that are working on the same thing that we are. Would you like to expand upon the advice that you received? I'm sure a lot of people would be very interested to know. So uh, Jan gave me some pretty good advice uh, a couple of months ago that was, was basically to do with uh, the way I phrased things and the way I, I kind of ended uh, particular sentences and began particular sentences when working with a co-caster. Uh, co so it, it was just kind of um, tidying up some of the rough edges that I, I had at the time and I still do it from time to time. It's difficult to uh, not to lapse back into it but uh, one of the other things he said was be confident in the things you say which sounds really obvious but it's not until you hear somebody say your analysis is actually pretty good. Just actually be more confident with it because people see through uh, when you're not confident in what you're saying. They will completely disregard anything that's said with uh, a little bit of nerve. So that's one of the other things he said to me was, uh, you know, be pretty confident. Do you have any closing thoughts to end with? Uh, just that I really enjoyed doing the Face It invitationals and uh, I really hope I can come back and do more because they're pretty awesome. You guys look after me very well and uh, are all awesome people. Well, thanks very much for answering my questions and best of luck in the future. Thanks.